Welcome to the Transforming Trauma Podcast. Transforming Trauma is presented by the NARM Training Institute. I'm your host, Sarah Buino, and I'm delighted to have you join us today. Hi, Transforming Trauma listeners. Do you want to join the international NARM community in support of trauma-informed care? If so, please consider joining us for the NARM Online Basics Training to become a NARM-informed professional. This is the level one training in the neuroaffective relational model for helping professionals working with complex trauma. This professional training is designed to support those of you working with clients or populations dealing with the effects of adverse childhood experiences and complex trauma. This training is for helping professionals in a variety of fields, such as mental health professionals, substance abuse counselors, educators, doctors, nurses, other healthcare providers, coaches, body workers, and more. In this online training, participants will learn more about the changing field of trauma, a deeper understanding of the impacts of ACEs and complex trauma, and how NARM, one of the first models specifically designed to address CPTSD, can support professionals in the growing trauma-informed field. This NARM online basics training will be taught by NARM senior faculty members, Brad Kammer and Stephanie Klein, as well as a team of experienced NARM trainers with a special instruction by NARM creator, Dr. Lawrence Heller. If you are looking for more advanced training in understanding the impacts of attachment, relational, developmental, and intergenerational trauma, and you're working in healthcare, education, substance abuse recovery, or allied fields, please join us for this level one NARM training to become a NARM informed professional. The next NARM online basics training is starting in September 2021 and will run one weekend a month through December 2021. 60 continuing education units will be available for most helping professionals. Register now to reserve your spot. Please visit www.narmtraining.com slash online basics. We hope you'll join us in learning how to transform trauma. Today on Transforming Trauma, I'm speaking with Ken Seeley. Ken has remained professionally and personally involved in recovery since his sobriety date of July 14, 1989. He applies his relevant experience and boundless enthusiasm to change the lives of people suffering from the disease of addiction. His innate compassion for fellow addicts continually bolsters his ability to connect and communicate with addicts and their families. Ken's remarkable success rate has turned him into one of the most sought-after interventionists in the country. Ken is also an author, founder of Ken Seeley Communities and Intervention 911 in Palm Springs, California. He's also been a featured interventionist on the Emmy Award-winning A&E television series Intervention since 2005. So please enjoy my conversation with Ken Seeley. Hello, Ken. Welcome to Transforming Trauma. How are you? Good, good. How are you? Well, I'm personally really excited to speak with you. I told you before that I'm also an addiction specialist. And I was actually thinking today when I was in grad school learning about addiction, I watched intervention and celebrity rehab, like those were my training grounds. And so I'm a little starstruck and very excited to be with you today. Oh, thank you for watching. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, before we we dig into everything, the first question that we'd like to ask on the podcast is, what would you like listeners to get out of our conversation today? Hopefully some insight on seeing that even though you might not think you have trauma or maybe you don't think that, you know, it's that bad, that you dig a little deeper. I guess maybe that's a good thing. Just look a little harder and I'll get into that as we get talking. I think that's so important because I think if we just push ourselves, maybe that's a good way. Push yourself. That's what I'm hoping people get out of today. Push yourself Mm. a little bit more digging to find out why things aren't working if you're uncomfortable at any stage of your life. Mm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Well, why don't you tell folks, for folks who might not know who you are, would you give yourself a little introduction? Sure, sure. So my name is Ken Seeley. And I got sober July 14th, 1989. But who's counting? <laughs> God, right? Well, that tells right. me that I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm getting old and that ain't right because I don't feel any older, but obviously I am. I got sober then. I did sober jobs in the meantime for the first 10 years of my recovery. I did home health care, took care of people at home, got certified in that. 
And then after that, I ran a nonprofit for a while. It was a 12-step house, the West Hollywood Alcohol and Drug Center. After that, got into interventions. You know, I started answering the phone and, uh, for a treatment center and started the intervention process, went and got certified doing interventions, and now opened up a treatment center a few years back, sober living a few years before that. And just love helping people. I guess that's the key. I, it's helping people is just such a passion. Right. And one of the things that I, I see with a lot of folks who've experienced their own recovery and addiction, there really is this voracious desire to help somebody the way that you were helped. Exactly. I mean, I lived in the pain. I always looked at it like I was fearful that I would die and go to hell, you know, because I'm a sinner. Mm. Now I look at it as I lived in hell in my addiction. And I mm. died and went to heaven in recovery. That's really sweet. That's very beautiful. And why wouldn't everybody get that opportunity? That's the thing is just being able to open up the doors and say, we all get that opportunity. We're only here for a short period of time. Like I was just showing you before we started that yeah. I'm sitting right next to Coco Head. And Coco Head was a volcano. How many years ago? 30,000 years ago? 35,000 years ago? And Diamond Head was a volcano 100,000 years ago. So when you look at those kind of numbers, look how short of a time we're here. Mm -hmm. It's such a short period of time that we get to experience life and to be able to enjoy it at the fullest that we can. That's my hope for everyone, that we get, we get to enjoy it and not exist in it and suffer through it. We get to really live in it and enjoy it. Yeah. Well, I'm curious if we integrate, you know, trauma into this perspective. For you personally, do you feel like part of the reason that you became addicted in the first place, did that have anything to do with trauma for you? Well, for years, I never thought so. You know, I have the gene. You know, my grandfather's brother died in the streets of alcoholism in Puerto Rico years and years and years ago. And and then my cousins, I have relatives that are alcoholics that went through treatment numerous of times. So it's always been in my family genes. So I never really connected the dots for trauma for many, many years. And it wasn't until doing workshops like NARM and other, you know, different types of workshops that I understood what trauma really was. And I always looked at it like I would hate when the TV show would say, oh, well, addiction is rooted in some form of trauma. And I was like, that's not true. You know, I am an alcoholic addict. I don't have an off switch. And I was never raped. I was never beaten at home. I was never sexually abused at home. I was never verbally abused at home, physically abused. At home. None of that happened. And so, you know, my mom stayed at home. My dad was a fireman. We had his fireman mm. friends and relatives. I mean, we were really that half Puerto Rican family where we were all like, my mom had six brothers and sisters. So we were always with cousins and relatives and just a normal upbringing. I mean, camping in the summer, snowmobiling in the winter, there wasn't anything wrong. I mean, you know, when they would say it was trauma. And then after doing some trainings, <laughs> mm -hmm. I realized that going to kindergarten and preschool, I remember the first time going to school, I was scared to death of people and leaving my mom. And hmm. I would like just be paralyzed in fear around people. And what that does with little kids is it makes you a target. You know, mm -hmm. that one paralyzed. Why is he not engaged in what's happening around him? And kids don't even realize they're doing it, but then they become really cruel and they start picking on you. And mm. then as you get into, you know, elementary school and junior high, it's, you know, bullying and constantly being beat up, bullied. I remember mm. waiting in line, you know, when you're in PA and you're in the gym class and everybody picks somebody on their team, you know, and I would always be the last one to be picked. And mm. I would have a panic attack, but trying to hold in the panic attack because Oof. I didn't want people to see it, you know, because right. in you being that weak, it would give them more reason to pick on you even more. So by doing the trainings and by learning more about trauma, 
it was more of not a, an instance of that was traumatic, but more of a repetitive traumatic experience of waking up in the morning and saying, I'm safe at home. I don't want to walk out that front door. I'm scared to death, but I can't tell my family about being scared because if I tell them, then that will make it worse because then they'll go stick up for me and then they'll even make more fun of me. So I just got to bite the bullet and deal with this fear and this anxiety and everything on my own. And that happened from four years old till 14 years old when I started doing trauma. Mm. So that was trauma that I didn't realize was trauma. I was like, there is no trauma. And they're like, Ken, wake up. <laughs> yeah. And since you went through the online basics training for NARM, I'm I'm curious if there's anything in particular that you took from that training that enhanced your understanding of whether it's your own trauma experience or the folks that you've worked with. Yeah, I think the best thing that, you know, I took from the training and we did it back in person back then before COVID. <laughs> mm. So we were able to do the training in person in Florida. The thing I loved about it was really being sensitive to ask the right questions. How do you ask the right questions and how do you present it in a non-threatening way that's going to open up that Pandora box to give the individual and give me the freedom to tap into it? Because my trauma response was to be invisible and ignore it. You know, it's mm. really not there. It doesn't hurt. So you don't want to open up that box because it's been sealed for so many years. And how do you give somebody permission to do that? And I think that's what I learned in the best, the most in my training is giving that permission, giving that awareness, and then walking them through it that, you know, and now I do trauma eggs with all of our clients. I, you know, waking up at three in the morning here in Hawaii so I could start at 5.30 after walking my dog and doing trauma eggs, you know, in California time at 8.30 over Zoom. I, I Zoom in for them. But what happens with the trauma, and I always like to, you know, express it where people could under be relatable to it. Mm -hmm. So with the trauma, you know, that I, I suffered with is when I would be bullied and be made fun of, I went into my automatic pilot, my addict's hustle is how do I become invisible? Because if I'm invisible, I won't get hurt. So I worked really, really hard at being invisible. And I did a really good job at it where people wouldn't see me. I would never get picked. I would, you know, but then I would get angry because people didn't see me. So it was that double-edged sword is I finally accomplished my goal, but now how come nobody sees me? And mm -hmm. this horrible, vicious cycle back and forth. So I put that hustle, I call it my safety vest. My safety vest mm -hmm. is be invisible, you won't get hurt. And when you get to know people, the thing that you, you see that happens for people that experience trauma, and I see it in my practice all the time, is you experience the trauma and then you say, okay, I want that person to prove that they love me or they want to be my friend. So the way they prove it is, okay, they got to do A, B, and C. So they do A, B, and C, and then I raise the bar. Oh, but you didn't do that. You didn't do EFT, H-I-J-K. Uh, there's a lot more you got to do. Uh. And then it gets to the point where they got to read my mind if they really want to prove that they love me or care about me. And so my expectations are always 150% for anybody that I let in. And the human being could only give 100%, but I'm wanting 150. And most people are lucky to be able to give you 50. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, 50 is a pretty good, somebody cares about you. Hello, they at least acknowledge you. You're in the room. 50% is pretty damn good, especially with the social media out there. Okay. So 50%, I think, is good, but I'm wanting 150. So my hustle was that I always needed the expectations of others to prove that they cared about me. And that was my disease. That's my sickness. And when they didn't meet it, I will plead a case. And I should have been an attorney because I am good at that. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm really good at that because I will plead that case and I will have everyone believing me because it's true. It's factual. They did this, 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 and this. And I state all the facts and I present it in a way that makes it look like, you know, yep, I'm the victim in this. And I got everybody to believe in it. I believe in it. And what it does is it isolates me away from people. And that, again, is more of my hustle, my addict's hustle, that keeps me in my disease. So when you deal with trauma, you got to, number one, unravel the box of that Pandora box and open it up and then be able to know how to work with them on really grasping on to what was their safety jacket, their vest that they put on. I call it their cape. What was their cape that they put on to keep them safe? And it's so interesting. Oh my God. I'm sure you've seen it in your practice. It's so interesting to watch when people, you know, at four years old, they put on the cape. And, you know, I got sober at 26 years old. At 26 years old, I'm still using that behaviors and those traits to keep me safe. So when I unravel through a trauma egg and see all the traits that are, you know, well, this happened to me and this happened to me and that happened to me. And then when you look back and you stand back and watch and say, but what is your part in all those things that I'm not saying what is your part in if you got raped, you know, but I'm saying, what is your part in the behaviors that led up to the trauma experience? And when you look at the behaviors that led up to it, a lot of them are that little kid that's trying to be invisible. Yeah. And I'm trying to put my my norm lens onto this. And what I hear you saying in terms of like the protective jacket, maybe the way that we would frame that in norm is that's the adaptation to yep. our experience of the trauma, right? And you know, what I've loved so much as a, a therapist doing norm is I feel like it takes the pressure off me to get a client somewhere or to from what I've been working with, they don't even need to tell me what the trauma is necessarily. But when we're looking just at those adaptations and what they're doing to themselves now, based on what happened when they were, like you said, four or whatever age that that was, that that's where I'm finding the magic really unlocking is just recognizing the relationship that we've I mean, a lot of my clients are just beating themselves up, shaming themselves, like pressuring, judging, all of that sort of stuff. And then when we throw the self-sabotage behaviors like addiction onto it, it's lethal. Yeah. And that's why so many people are dying right now. And then we have COVID on it and it really is. It's what's killing so many people out there. And that's all it is. It's, I mean, I don't want to sound callous, but you know, it doesn't matter about what the trauma is. It's about the traits and the behaviors that we create to protect ourselves. And then how are they not working for us as adults? And to be aware of them and have an awareness wrapped around about what those traits are, that's the first step of being able to change them. Right. You can't heal what you can't feel. Or see or know or whatever is around you. So Mm -hmm. giving them that opportunity to be able to see it clear as day And then showing them, okay, well, let's try these different traits, behaviors to get that result that they're shooting for because Mm. shooting. And that's another tool that I like about Norm is what are your goals, right? It's less about the goal and more about creating space for what it is that you want for yourself and then looking at the things that are getting in the way of that. I mean, that is pretty counterintuitive to the way that we're taught to work with people, right? Because if you have somebody in front of you who's suffering from addiction, of course, we think in our heads, like the goal is to get you to stop using substances. And yet using the substances is the adaptation of the trauma that they're using to try to stay safe, right? (laughs) So we can't just yank those away, right? And I, I think, I guess I'm wondering about when people get forced into treatment, which does sometimes happen. And then there's, you know, I don't like to use the term relapse because I feel like that's so stigmatized. But, you know, when they do return to use after treatment, how much of that has to do with them not having the internal capacity to make different choices, right? To relate to themselves differently. Yeah, no, totally. Without the awareness, they're not going to 
and the motivation. You know, you got to create the motivation. Nobody ever comes into treatment or a therapy session because they got a raise at work or they got engaged. You know, they, oh, let's get engaged. Okay, I'm going to check into treatment today. You got a bed available. I want to deal with my trauma now. That's not the way it works. The way it works is there was some motivation that motivated them to get to your front door. And the only motivation I know of is pain. I don't know any other way to get you in the front door of starting the process without pain. Because Mm -hmm. if you're not in pain, then why would you change? Yeah. And it's interesting as you're saying that, I'm thinking back to when I was working in the treatment center and I totally agree with you that obviously the good things are not what bring people in. But what I found when I was working there is I was working with professionals. Actually, I worked with our mutual friend, Jeff, for a little while there and working with, you know, doctors, lawyers, nurses, people with, you know, really high profile careers. And oftentimes a lot of folks would tell me that, you know, oh, I was in this really great place in my career and I screwed it all up because I used or The thing that was most interesting to me is we would get fourth year medical resident students and they would get this close to graduating and then they would get caught using, right? And in NARM, we talk a lot about aliveness and really being connected to ourselves and the goodness of life is scary and hard for some folks to tolerate. And that also being an adaptation of trauma, right? Yeah. Fear of success. Right, right. And I feel that too. Actually, I've been really feeling into that as I like expand and NARM has been so helpful for me, both personally and professionally. And as I expand into that, I find a lot of fear and a lot of contraction from being so visible and being so myself. I don't know. (laughs) That's great. Yeah, no, it's when you look at it from a standing back, it's so simple. But when you're in it, it's so difficult. You know, right. Your number one symptom is denial. But You know, the only way to break through it is pain. I mean, I've never seen the 31 years that I've been clean and I tried for four years before that. So 35 years, I've never seen anybody come to the door without, you know, the nudge from the judge is a big one. The nudge from the (laughs) medical, right? The medical board, like you're talking about, you know, the high license, the nurses, the doctors, they Mm -hmm. they don't come in because they want to come in. They come in because they get a little nudge. You know, I was just doing someone's trauma egg this morning and his nudge, he's like, oh, yeah, everything's great. I really wanted this. And I was like, "Uh, your wife told you to leave, (laughs) you know, know, around the kids anymore. So, no, you didn't really come in because you wanted it. You came in because you had that nudge, that awareness. Mm. I was just going to ask if you could tell me more about the trauma egg, because I'm not familiar. Is that like a particular intervention style or what is that? So a trauma egg is you write down all the different traumas that you've had in your past from the earliest age until current age, and you put it in an egg format. And in the egg, you put little like corners around it, and then you draw pictures instead of writing what it is. Because as you're drawing the picture of the situation, you're using the opposite side of your brain than writing it out. So it's like writing with your the opposite hand. So now you're getting more into the feeling of it versus the, you know, just the thought process of it. So you're able to experience it at a different level. But when you present it in a group setting, you're not looking at the traumas. You're looking at the traits that follow the traumas. And then once you find the traits that follow it, you give them an awareness around what the traits are and say, you know, In all reality, human beings, we're meant to have trauma. I mean, I don't know anybody that's never experienced trauma. If you've never experienced trauma, then you're not human, okay? (laughs) Yes, you're an interstellar being and give me whatever that is. (laughs) I I don't know anybody. I mean, I'm doing these trauma eggs for years. I mean, every single human being has experienced trauma. I mean, it's just what do we do about the trauma and how do we take those childhood reactions and turn them into responses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm thinking too, a lot of the clients who would tell me that they hadn't experienced trauma, this is all before my NARM training. A lot of those folks often would identify with a lot of perfectionism and sort of the overachieving behaviors, which 
I didn't understand quite so saliently until I went through NARM exactly how those are trauma responses. I was actually having this conversation with a friend today because she was saying, oh, you achieved so much. I'm so in awe in you. And what I said back to her was, please don't be in awe of my trauma response. <laughs> you know, for me, a lot of that performing, right? Yeah. yeah, for me, that that is certainly a reaction and an adaptation that I've been really, it's shown a light on that I'm trying to really soften, right? And so then, you know, getting a response from someone praising you for that, of course, for years, for me, that's fed that sort of, you know, truthfully, like workaholism. Yeah, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. Prove that you're yeah. good. And so you're always right. you know, get to a certain level. Oh, I'm not there yet. And you go, oh, I got to go to this one. I got to go. I get that all the time. How did you get so successful? I was like, I'm not successful. <laughs> it's like, mm. I, I don't feel I'm successful at all. I, I still got a long way to go. And mm -hmm. there's a way to respond to that where, okay, I could still have that feeling, but I don't have to be fighting to get to the next level would full steam ahead and find balance, you know, where I'm still able to take care of myself. But I look at it, you know, like I shared yesterday, you just said you shared about it too. I shared about mm -hmm. it yesterday in another group that, you know, some of the things that happened are some of the best things that happened to create who I am. Because, I mean, if I didn't have these traumas, I wouldn't be so motivated, I guess. And the motivation has bought success and the motivation has bought self-esteem and the motivation has built, you know, an amazing life that I'm able to have. But if I didn't have the trauma to push the motivation, it's with the workaholism, like you said, if I'm going to take it to workaholism, then it's off balance. Yeah. And I guess for me, I try to tune into, it's not even about motivation. It's sort of even if I think, kind of like you said earlier, you were saying like, let's give folks the space to dig deep and understand that we've all, you know, experienced trauma. I'm curious in terms of the show intervention, I'm sure a lot of folks would really love to hear about that. And I'm curious, the folks that you ended up working with on that show, what sort of trauma you were seeing for those folks that you were conducting interventions with? We do an intervention training, you know, to train people to become interventionists. And I think that's the key component is really understanding, you know, when you do our training, you'll do genograms and mm -hmm. you do a genogram, you're able to, and I don't do a genogram with the interventions. Like I don't do the ARISE model. I love Judith and I love the ARISE model, but I don't have time. I get in and I do the intervention and then I let bring them to a treatment center where they can do a genogram and all of that. But I do one in my mind, like asking the key questions with the family system. And then you find out where they came from and you're watching the same thing happen that happened to dad, you know, when he was a kid. And so somebody's got to break the cycle. And that's really what an intervention is. It's not on the individual that we're intervening on. It's really about intervening on the family system because yeah, I could get somebody into treatment and they could do really well. But if I don't educate the family that it's a family disease and that, you know, there's a reason why Johnny behaves this way. And if you could change, and we call it a family realignment, and you could realign some of the behaviors that you're doing, you're going to get a different Johnny. And if Johnny realigns some of the behaviors that he does, he's going to get a better life for himself. So the intervention process is really, really important. And a lot of interventionists don't do that. A lot of interventionists just go in and say, I'm just, my job is to get you to treatment. And I believe that's creating more harm because you got to really help the family understand that they need to be just as involved as the addict is in treatment. And that treatment is not 30 days, 60 days, or 90 days. Treatment is a minimum of a year. And that's the reason why where we learn that recovery is a process and you have to at least be engaged for a minimum of a year of heavy, heavy, heavy therapy and counseling and guidance. And if you go to 12 steps or if you go to, you know, some kind of peer recovery support, if it's, you know, what are some of those really good ones that are out there? I mean, 
Smart Recovery and Dharma Recovery. Yep, there's all kinds of different ones out there. I mean, I used to speak at a church, there would be 400 people there. You know, all the treatment centers would come down to this church. So I think I went to that. Was it in LA? Orange County, yep. Yes, I was visiting. I can't even remember, but it was a treatment center and they were like, you've got to go to this 12 step meeting. It was, that was one of the coolest like experiences I've had as a professional. And, you know, I'm a grateful member of Al-Anon myself. So I was really appreciating. There were hundreds of people and they had a moment where they asked, you know, who has 24 hours? And then these young people would come up and they'd get their coin and everybody would cheer for them. That was, I was weeping through the entire thing. That is so incredible. Amazing, right? Randy Morales yes. in Orange County that he does it every Friday. And it's just yes. beautiful. To, you know, that's what people do because addiction and mental health issues is separation on um, why I'm so different. Why don't I fit in? And recovery is about connection. So how do we get them connected? And believing in themselves is the first start, but really having those relationships with their peers And again, I don't care what peer group you join. I don't care which one it is. You just have to join one of them. You know, find the one that you connect with and jump in there and do it. Because, you know, that's why 12 Steps has been so successful for so many years, 80 plus years now, is because it's building a connection. You may not like the person sitting next to you, but you end up, you know, loving them because they've been through the same thing that you've been through. So it's really amazing. And then, Celebrate recovery. I mean, there's so many of them. Find your posse, I always say. Find your posse and stick with it. Yeah. And from the trauma perspective, I think the NARMI way of thinking about it too is rebuilding that connection with self as well. Yes. That's the most important. We gave up on ourselves. We stopped loving ourselves. You know, it norms about let's get them connected to themselves, you know, and that's the key. Mm, Yeah. Is there anything that we didn't talk about today that you think you want to make sure listeners are left with? Yeah, you know, the show's been on 16 years. If you watch the show, just know that they're trying to add it up in 50 minutes or whatever time they frame they get to air it. But really, there's so much more work behind it. You know, there's so much more. You know, it isn't as easy as it seems on the show. It's really, really hard on getting the families on board. You know, if you watch the season premiere for this year, season 22, episode one, you'll see how bad the families really could be and how you have to really work with them. I think that was the clearest one. They they made it a two-hour episode because there was so much information in there. But that'll show you more of it in depth of what really happens behind the scenes of an intervention. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate your time and it was lovely to see your home and see your view. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for joining us for today's episode. To find more about our guest, check the show notes or visit us at www.narmtraining.com slash transforming trauma. Please join us starting in September for our NARM online basics training to learn how to transform trauma. This NARM online basics training is available for helping professionals working with clients or populations dealing with complex trauma. Now more than ever before, it is essential that we learn how to resolve complex trauma and support post-traumatic growth. If you're looking for more advanced training in understanding the impacts of attachment, relational, developmental, and intergenerational trauma, and you're working in healthcare, education, substance abuse recovery, or other allied fields, join us for this level one NARM training to become a NARM-informed professional. For more information and to apply, please visit www.narmtraining.com slash online basics. Thanks to Andrea Clunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for producing and editing, to Tori Essex for our album art, and to Brad Kammer for the creation of this podcast. We look forward to building community and connection with you and changing the world by transforming trauma. Mm-hmm.